Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of all of the folk, not very many, yes, but enough, at Bible Talk, and Alice and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's such a blessing to be able to gather in, in, in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Because the word of God is that necessary food. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the word of God is so important that I would remind you once again. Test what I say. Spend time in the word. Spend time in the word. Make sure that you are hearing from God. You know, I, I believe that we are in those perilous last days. And Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Well, let me tell you, the only place that faith comes from is hearing the Word of God. Amen. And then Amen. acting upon it, okay? Doing it. Doing it. Don't just talk about it. Do it. So, um, we're going to do a something a little bit different today because we have come to the end of the Sermon mm -hmm. on the Mount. Uh, after studying that for about a year, we I think we've been in there for close to 50 weeks. Uh, and it's worthwhile, and I'll talk to you about that in just one moment. Mm -hmm. But first, I'm going to ask Alice if you will ask the Lord's blessing on uh, our time together. Yes, Father, we do. We come before you and ask that you guide and direct our tongues. Let us not say anything that we don't hear from you. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for this precious word. And we ask, Lord, that you would touch hearts that Excellent. are listening to this, that they would be open to hear it and to obey it. And we ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, well, as I said, uh, for the past close to a year, we have been studying the Sermon on the Mount. And that is a very worthwhile effort. Because, as I said in the very beginning of this, and by the way, that's all on the, on the website, uh, on the BibleTalk.com, www.BibleTalk.com. It's on InSearchOfChristianity.com. Um, it's available on, through our Facebook pages on Bible Talk and In Search of Christianity. So if you've missed some and the Spirit of God leads you to want to catch up on some of these, they're all there. Um, the entire, I wanna, I, let me make this clear so there's no misunderstanding. Mm. The Apostle Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, mm. in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And he said, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable, okay? And it says, whatever, Peter, I think it was Peter wrote, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. We might have hope. Everything in the Word of God is important and profitable, okay? Um, it's not like there's some verses that are better than yeah, others, right. okay? So from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, it's all important. You know, as a matter of fact, I, not, as I always do, I'll distract myself a little bit. I had a conversation with Alice the other day as we were traveling. I think we were down south in, in the London area or in South Wales. And I said, have you never had anybody ask you what your favorite verse is in the Bible? As a matter of fact, that was one of the issues in the, uh, the, the um, United States election when one of the candidates was asked what his favorite verse was. Okay. You shouldn't have a favorite verse. <laughs> All scripture is God breathed. Every single word that God spoke can build faith, has importance. It's there for our instruction. It's there to build up and encourage us in our in our godly hope that we have. The fact is there are some scriptures that may be more influ have been more influential in your life, and that's fine. Okay? Uh, I mean, there there are certain verses in my life, one particular, which I'll, I'm not going through now, but from Psalm 8, which was the very verse, it was the first time that I heard the Lord God Almighty speak to me, was the first time I opened the Bible on my birthday, decades and decades, decades. and decades ago. <laughs> and I flipped open to this verse, and it was like, wham! It was the voice of God speaking to me. And by the way, every word in here is God speaking, speaking to you. So obviously, that verse has real important meaning in my life. If you have favorite verses, maybe it's just because you don't understand the others. And, and that's all right. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we grow in our understanding. 
It's a living word. You can have been studying it for years. I've been studying this word for over 40 years now, and I can still go in here and see things that I've never seen before. Or I visit and I spend time with other brothers and sisters, and somebody will have an insight that I've never seen before. Mm. It's a living word, okay? You can't use it up and you can't make it go out, all right? Mm -hmm. but, but understand that while all Scripture is God-breathed, there has to be a certain significance to the Sermon on the Mount. Because this is when Jesus Christ, at the beginning of his ministry, gathered his disciples, named the apostles, mm -hmm. and then in preparation for sending them out, for, for building his church, okay, built upon a rock, for sending them out into the world as the light of the, the world and the, the, salt the, salt of the, of the, earth. the salt of the earth, making us all ambassadors. This was the training, the training in righteousness. This is the training that we have as the core of all Scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, it says in Revelation that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Everything, all the prophecies in the Scripture point to Jesus Christ. Yes. It says that the law is a tutor that leads us to Christ. So everything before the Sermon on the Mount, everything from Genesis to Malachi, is there to lead us to Jesus Christ and his teaching. Everything that comes after is basically like commentary on what he said. That's right. So it refers back to it. Yes, yeah. this is the core. You know why? Because the people, the people of God, had gotten to a place where they lacked understanding and they had, they had drifted from a right relationship with the Father. The purpose of, our, of Jesus coming to this earth was to restore a right relationship, at my right relationship, Alice's right relationship. Our relationship. And I pray your right relationship with God the Father. Amen. And in, to ensure that we would have the ability to understand this, when Jesus ascended into heaven, prior to doing that, he said when he, he would send the spirit of truth into our lives. Amen. Now remember, Jesus is the truth, mm -hmm. okay? So the Holy Spirit now, which indwells us, as the scripture attests to, is there to lead us into the truth. We have to desire the truth. We have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Oh, that's in the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, it is. <laughs> we have to seek God and seek his kingdom and seek his righteousness so that everything can be added to us. Oh, yes, that's in the Sermon on the Mount. Again. And the problem has always been that there has been a conflict between man-made religion and righteousness. Paul said that in Colossians. He mm -hmm. talks about there are things you can do that have the appearance of, of it, it's man-made religion, but it doesn't establish righteous relationships with God the Father. You know why? Because there's nothing you can do in terms of work to do that. People thought that. I mean, there are people today who, I promise you, who think that. There are people Jesus talked about at the very end of time that will come to him and start to boast in their works. Saying, Lord, look what I did in your name. I did this in your name. I did that in your name. And he says, depart from me, you evil ones. I never knew you. Oh, yes, that's in the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, it is. So religious people, the scribes and Pharisees, who were so invested in their version of religion, they were teaching the people, did they have understanding? Did they have a right heart? Well, most of them did not. Which is why Jesus said to people, said to his disciples, he said, well, you know, I, I know you've heard it said, but I say to you, and gave them new understanding. He said, you have heard it said, but I say to you, and gave me new understanding. Over and over and over. You see, Jesus Christ, and we established in the very beginning of this broadcast, a uh, long time ago, that Jesus Christ did not come to start a new religion. He came to restore a right understanding. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount does. This show, this program, is called In Search of Christianity. We have been blessed. I mean, I have been in ministry for 40 years. 
and I have had the opportunity. I mean, Alice and I have traveled. I, I have been to over 50, I think around 55 countries on five continents. And as we go, we've been blessed to have fellowship with people from all different denominations. Uh, I mean, I, all over the world. And I, I have to, I know this sounds harsh, but I have to stand by the truth. I have to speak the truth in love. I've been saying as of late that as we've traveled this, this very year, as a matter of fact, we're, we're in England as we're filming this. Mm -hmm. And by the time you see it, we'll be on the high seas on our way back to the United States. You know, we're seven months over here, and we were traveling the entire year before before we left for England. Um, I I have to say it just the way I see it. I said the hardest thing that I've found to find is a Bible believing, spirit filled Christian who actually believes the Bible. Whoa, that may sound harsh. But you know what? You can't pick and choose what you believe out of the Bible. The whole Bible, the whole Word of God, you have to believe it all. Will Jesus find faith? Will he find people who, are, who have, their lives are based on what they have heard from God and their action is based on what they're doing because they've heard what he has said to us? This is serious stuff. I, I keep saying this. This is life and death. This is, no, this is no little matter. So this whole teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, it's almost like, and I was having a conversation with a dear brother, Morris Barrett. Um, you can go check him out. Morris Barrett at Mar Barrett Ministries, that's B-A-R-R-A-T-T Ministries dot org dot UK. Dear brother, and he and I have had a lot of fellowship over here this year. And in, in the course of it, we were talking about uh, just the, the concept of people being in the Word, being active in the Word, living the Word. Well, I mean, I don't, you know, I, <laughs> I don't say these things for condemnation. As a matter of fact, we did a lot of teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount yes, about did. judgment. Yes. Okay? Because Jesus taught about judgment. But we are to examine all things and test all things. So I'm not saying what I say for condemnation, but for correction. Because we all need a word of correction. That's called discipleship. And God disciplines, that's discipling, God disciplines those whom he loves. If he doesn't disciple you, it's because you're not his child. And when he disciples us, he is making us partakers of his holiness. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 12. Check it out. So, so here we are. We have spent all this time, an incredible amount of time. And if you haven't seen them, please go look at them. But think about it. Think about Jesus teaching his apostles how to, and disciples how to pray. Right? And, and one of the things he said in there, it's all there in the study. He said, when you pray, pray this way. Forgive us our debts as we forgive others. That's the love of God, which does not take into account a wrong suffering. It does not take offense. Mm. So if we're not forgiving others, we're not being forgiven. That's very serious. It's very, very serious. When he says, you know, people come to me all the time and they say, oh, you know, teach us about tithing. Tithing is so hard or this and that. You know what? They, they say, well, we're not under the law anymore. Praise God, you're not under the law. But the law is still there. The word is still there and is intended to be a blessing in your life. It all depends on how you respond to it. Let me talk about tithing. Yes, in, in past times, in times past, mm -hmm. you heard it said it was 10% of what you grew, what you brought in, went back to the Lord. Well, hallelujah, we're not under that anymore. Now it's 100%. Hallelujah. It all belongs to him. Nothing it, belongs to us. Yes, nothing. Nothing belongs to us. God entrusts us with things, yes. gives us stewardship over his possessions, and we are responsible for what we do with him. You know, that, that verse... The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, everything that it contains, and the people therein. That's not New Testament. That's the Old Testament. 
You know, there's nothing new in the New Testament. No. There's nothing new in the New Testament other than our understanding that comes from the Word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is so serious. Because if you look at the world around you today, and people, I, listen, I know that people have been saying for a thousand years, well, you know, the Lord, people were saying back then in the time of Jesus, the apostles. God's coming, he's coming, the time is coming soon. Well, it's not, it, it couldn't have come soon then because there were prophecies that had to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. You want to know something? There are not many prophecies that have to be filled now, okay? So we have to be ready in season and out. We have to be those faithful witnesses to a dark and troubled world. And all you have to do is look at the world around us and see how dark and troubled it is. The answer is not new social legislation. The answer is not more. more. The answer is the only thing that, or the thing that can only come from the Lord God Almighty, and that is righteousness. And you know what? You can't work it up. You can't make it happen. It is that it, because it comes with salvation. Salvation makes you righteous. And that is not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a free gift of God. But it comes with a heart that surrenders to God. We have to start to look at this. You know, it, I just want to say this. If you've been following us in the Sermon on the Mount, here's what I suggest. Go do it again. Amen. Go do it on your own. You can't spend too much time here. Yeah. And then as you go out and you start to see and read the writings of the Apostle Paul, read what John the Apostle wrote, read what Peter wrote, and you start to see, oh my goodness, see what James wrote. It's all commentary on what Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount. Right. And it should be. There's no conflict in the Scriptures. These are people that were enlightened. And given understanding. And given understanding by the words of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit within them. It changed them. Yes. It changed mm -hmm. Peter from somebody, a common fisherman, mm. who then denied Jesus Christ into a man filled with power and boldness who would go out and stand before thousands of Jews and speak to them, speaking the truth and love and saying, You crucified the promised Messiah of Israel, speaking the truth in love. You know, one of the problems we have today is prophets are running around, so-called prophets, and all they're doing is telling you how good you are, how nice you are, and how great it's going to be. Well, I, I've said this and look at it. Primary ministry of a prophet is to expose our iniquity Amen. so we would repent and be cleansed of it. Because the great promise of the word, the great promise. I was going to say this is a promise. Don't let me forget this promise. Okay. But before I say it's a promise, it's a, it's a command. Because Jesus said, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Whoa. Are you perfect? Well, if I start to examine myself, and it says, let a man examine himself, I can see imperfection in my life. In the flesh, in the natural. Mm -hmm. But the great promise is that whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. God the Father, that potter, is in the process right now of molding and shaping us, taking things out of our life that are not Jesus Christ, so that you will be manifest. The perfection that dwells within you will be manifest in you. So on the Sermon on the Mount, that be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect, that's in the Sermon on the Mount. Almost anything you can say, I'm going to show you, you can point back to and see a reference to it in the Sermon on the Mount. Everything else, like I said, it's either leading up to it or it's commentary on it. We have been, I, I've been blessed to do this study every week. So, you know, every week we put up a, a new part of the study. Once a week's not enough. Going to, quote-unquote, going to church once a week is not enough. You have to meditate in, in the Word day and night. 
That's what it says. If you want to be, quote unquote, successful as a Christian, you need to be meditating in the the Word day and night. Go read Psalm 1. Go, Go read. Read the Word. Abide in the Word. Because it will stir that faith up in you. I said this from the beginning. And I know this upsets people. What kind of Christian ought you to be? Let's see. I mean, really, what should you be? Should you be a Baptist? A Lutheran? Look at the Catholics. They're trying to get together with the Lutherans again. Oh, my goodness. That's a, that's a sign yes. of the times. Are you supposed to be an evangelical Christian? Are you supposed to be a charismatic or Pentecostal Christian? What are you supposed to be? Well, you should be excited, for one thing. And you should be a Christian who is abiding in the Word being conformed. God is doing a work in the lives of his people. Now, not everybody, you know, it says this in the Word, not everybody not, not everybody that calls himself a Jew is a Jew, but those who have been circumcised in the heart, all right? Everybody that calls himself a Christian is not a Christian because being this Christian is a call to be a fanatic. Amen. Yes. A fanatic. An excited fanatic. Oh, no. Those fanatics, they're bad people. That's, that's Satan's counterfeit to destroy. A fanatic is somebody who is wholly focused on the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Fixing their eyes on Jesus Christ. Not just once in a while. Fixing his eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. Fanaticism is God's purpose in our life. Just because the devil has made a poor and evil imitation of it doesn't mean that we should toss it out. Is not the highest command? Did not Jesus say this? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with some of your heart, part of your heart, a little of your heart, a lot of your heart. No, with all. With all. Well, that's pretty fanatical. If you are not a fanatic Christian, pray and ask God to forgive you. Ask him to stir up. You know, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, kindle afresh that gift. Maybe you need to have that fire that God put into you when you first first received him and accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you need to have that fire stirred up once again. Well, I think we all do. Because like any fire, you know, leave it It alone and it'll burn out by itself. You have to keep feeding it fuel. You have to stir it up. You have to stoke it. Okay? Let the Word of God richly dwell within you, the Spirit richly dwell in you. And yes, there are things that you can do to do this. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, and he said, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus then don't quench the Spirit. Quench it is to put that fire out. We need to get more serious about our relationship with the Lord and not be ashamed of it. I said that in our quest to search for Christianity, the Sermon on the Mount became the focus, the point. And we examined this. And we've been studying about judgment, examining what's going on inside the church. And we are supposed to be doing that. If you don't believe me, go back and see the ones we did on judgment here recently. But you know what? Now we're going to go into another part of our teaching. And we're going to start next week. And I believe this is going to be so important. It's going to be important in my life. And I believe it can be very important in your life. Because we need to be doing a search for Christianity in the person you see in the mirror. We need to be looking for true Christianity in our lives, in our hearts, in our mouth, in our actions. Mm -hmm. We need to see true Christianity. And true Christianity is what you see here in the Sermon on the Mount. Amen. So I pray that you're going to join us for that. Um, It comes from a a book that I'm just about finished called The Evidence of a Redeemed Life. Because if you have been redeemed by the shed blood of the Lamb, there has to be evidence of that redemption 
in, in your daily life, in everything that you do in life. So we're going to look at that because we want to find that faith. You know, Peter talked about the fact that, and remember, that's 2,000 years ago. He said, in the last days, in those perilous last days that Paul was talking about, mockers are going to come with their mocking, saying, where's the promise of his coming? It's always been like that. Well, I'm going to say something. It hasn't always been like it is right now. And the great signs of his coming are not out there with Russia and China and Trump and Clinton. The great signs of his coming are in the body of Christ, the church, or the so-called church. So please join us for that. Please join us. Please, if you haven't seen other parts of this, go back and, and view this, this whole series. It, it, write to us, you know, contact us. If you have questions, if you have comments, you can go to In Search of Christianity on Facebook or Bible Talk on Facebook and let us know what, what's going on in your life. Help us to be encouraging one another in our walk of faith. It has great, great value. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Yes. So I, w I want to thank you for inviting us into your life through these videos. I want to thank you for bringing us into and making us part of that body of Christ that you are. We need to have what fellowship we have. You know what? We don't, we, I don't know you. I'm not sitting in your living room with you. I wish I was, actually. But at least we can do this. And this is important. Stay. Encourage one another. Today, as long as it is called today, this is what's written in Hebrews, encourage one another. Not just on a Sunday. Not just on a Saturday. Every single day. Make sure that you're in good fellowship. And good fellowship by the way, is being around people who will encourage you to be in the Word, encourage you to be a fanatic for Jesus Christ, and if you're not, who will love you enough to speak the truth in love to you and call you to task. That's a blessing. It is a blessing. It is a blessing. Yes. Okay? So, I, I quite frankly don't know what else to say. I, I pray that you have been blessed by this time in the Sermon on the Mount, and I pray that you'll be blessed by what we do from here on out. Write to us and be a blessing to us. Encourage us, correct us, do whatever the Spirit of God leads you to do. But we need to be involved in each other's lives. So, Father, I just thank you that you've made us part of each other's lives. Yes, Lord, that there's only one body. There's only one faith. There's only one baptism. And most assuredly, there's only one Lord. So, Father, we thank you that by your grace, you have drawn us to that place where we call him Lord and we call him Savior. Lord, use our lives to touch other lives. Lord, help us to be, as you've called us to be, the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Help us to pray for our enemies, Lord God. Help us to be used by you to touch every life that we come into contact with. We praise you and thank you that you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise, that you can use us in our weakness, that your strength might be perfected and manifest. Father, we just thank you in the precious, wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, be back for that next part of the series. God bless you and goodbye. Bye.